Hello, welcome to Brew Day. I wanna take you through how I do a three gallon batch. So I'm gonna show you all of the steps. And if this is your first time, I think it'll be great for you to follow along and just see kind of a visual of how it's done. And if you've done this before, then hopefully I can show you some different ways of doing things. First off, there's a few ways to get this started. You know, um, you probably know them. The first is extract. So if you're new to brewing, I definitely recommend going with extract for your first couple times. It's just a great way to approach beer making, get used to the process and see it through. And then from there, uh, you're definitely going to want to upgrade to all grain eventually. You know, if this becomes a hobby that you really enjoy, all grain makes the biggest difference because you can do any recipe you want just by heading to your local brew store and picking out the exact amount of grains for whichever recipe you have as opposed to doing you know extract where the kits are kind of already predefined for you so when you do get to all grain there's a couple ways you can even go through that process you know one is mash ton which is what i really enjoy that's with this igloo container right here. Pretty much we're putting hot water in and our grain and we're gonna let that sit for an hour. And we want the igloo container so that it retains that heat at that specific temperature for that hour. Then we're going to rinse it with water and put all of that into our kettle and start the boil from there. The another option that is a lot easier is brewing a bag. And what you're gonna be doing there is just grabbing your kettle, putting a bag, in there and putting the grains in, keeping it at a moderate temperature on the stove. It's a great way to go, especially because all you really need is one big kettle, but it can also be a bit detrimental when you're working with a standard kitchen stove. If you have access to something like a turkey fryer and outdoors and a 15 gallon kettle, then by all means, brewing a bag is a great way to go. Um, but for me, you know, a lot of times I do have access to my friend's industrial kitchen where I can easily heat up eight, 10 gallons of water. But, you know, at the moment at my apartment, I'm here and I'm working off of a standard gas range. So uh, the mash ton works well for me and doing three gallon batches also helps kind of just ease the process along. There's a way to do five gallon batches on low power that I can show you in another video. But for today, we're just gonna do a standard three gallon batch, mash ton, let's get started. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna wanna do is get some water heated up. For us, we're heating up about two and a half gallons of water. I'm gonna be adding that into the mash ton and I'm aiming for 168 degrees because once it's in the mash ton and I've added the grain, we're expecting to see that temperature drop all the way down to 152, which is where we want the grain to sit for a full hour. Um, it's also good at this point to heat up some boiling water and maybe have some ice water nearby. That way, if the temperature does come out to be too high or too low, you can add some hotter or colder water to adjust that temperature in the mash tun. So there it is. Uh, we've put all of the grain and water in there, gave it a gentle stir. Don't stir it up too heavy. Um, just give it a nice gentle mix so that everything gets wet and um, you know, pretty much the same sort of consistency. There's no dry pockets in there. And uh, so yeah, uh, we ended up at 153, which is only one degree off. So that's pretty much perfect. Um, if you're five degrees off, that will make it a difference to your final results. So that's why I'm saying keep the ice water or the boiling water close by. You end up being five degrees over, throw some ice water in there, give it another quick stir, um, five degrees under boiling water or whatever you need to do. Um, 
So yeah, this igloo container is gonna keep it right at that temperature for the next hour. And then we'll be draining and rinsing or sparging. So I'm gonna fill up a kettle with another two and a half gallons of water and get that up to 162 degrees. And if you have one, a sous vide stick is actually great for this because you can just put this stick in there and let the water get up to that 162 and this device will keep the water exactly at that temperature. Great little, great little tool, not necessary, but quality of life improvement for sure. So, uh, let some water heat up, let this sit for an hour and I'll be back. It's a good time for a beer. All right, it's been one hour. This has just been sitting quietly here. So we are ready to pop the top and start draining it out. Um, then we will rinse with the sparge water and all of that will go into the brew pot, uh, which will bring to a boil and continue on from there. Quick note about the mash. If you drain slowly, that will help with the consistency of what you pull out. I also like to capture the first two quarts that comes out of the mash as well and recirculate that back on top. There's a lot of sediment in that first amount, so recirculating it just helps with clarity. So there you have it. We've drained everything out of the mash ton and we've put it now in the main kettle, which is coming to a boil. Um, it is pretty high up there. Uh, you know, it's probably like a five gallon kettle and with how, how tall, with how tall the liquid is reaching, I would estimate we're probably close to four gallons. So it is still going to take some time. So get your cover, put it on there, leave it and just be patient. It'll, it'll get there eventually. Another thing with this setup is that we won't be able to come to a rapid boil, um, but I actually prefer that. You know, I, I think that there's, you know, there's a lot of sugar and things in there that when you turn it up too high a heat at the bottom, it has a tendency to singe and burn the wart that's in there. So even if you're able to work with a butane burner or something like that, uh, use that high heat to get yourself up to a boil faster, but then you want to turn that heat down and bring it to kind of a low simmer. With that, you're going to get a nice calmer boil. You're not gonna burn anything in your process and you're gonna protect yourself from boil overs as well. You know, that's why I really do recommend giving it a shot. If you're somebody who's gone with rapid boiling for a long time now, um, try bringing that down. See what, see what difference it makes because it makes a big difference in, in my opinion. Okay, so for the next point of this, we are boiling our hops. And now the majority of beers are boiled for 60 minutes. Some IPAs go to 90, but for the majority of them, 60 minutes. So for the hops, you can add them just straight to the boil. Um, they are gonna get a little bit messy. At some point, you're going to want to filter it just so you get all of those hops out. Um, one way to guard against that is a hop strainer. So these aren't too expensive, I think around 25 bucks and they just go on the side of your kettle like this. And from there, you can throw the hops directly into that spider. All of the flavors are still gonna get merged and go throughout your wart, but you'll be able to pull that out at the end and throw away all that extra hop residue. It's just a little bit of extra way to get ahead of the filtration process. We've been boiling for 60 minutes, all of our hops have been added, and now it's time to cool down the wart. So we're gonna need a lot of ice for that. Doing the ice bath in the sink is a great option if you have a sink big enough for the kettle and the ice bath, but if it is too small, using a cooler is a great alternative as well. 
The process should take about 15 to 20 minutes and the faster you can do this, the better it guards against contamination. However, if it takes you a little bit longer, really don't sweat it, you should be just fine. The target pitch temp for your yeast, which is what you're trying to reach, should be printed on the back of the yeast packet. However, it's usually just safe to go with 65 to 70 degrees if you cannot find that temp range for whatever reason. Once you reach the target temp, you are ready to put the wort into your fermenter bucket. Best to use a mesh strainer or something to filter out the trub and gunk that is in the kettle. For me, I'm actually going to be doing a whirlpool method, which just means I'm stirring it vigorously for about three minutes and then letting it sit for 15. And at the end of that, all the trub and gunk is going to be in the bottom middle of the kettle and you'll be able to pull out clean final product by putting a siphon into the side and extracting everything on top. You can see at the bottom of your kettle just how much trub and grossness is there. So if this got into your fermenter bucket, it wouldn't be the worst thing. However, it's just nice to leave it behind at this stage. Once all the wort has been transferred into the fermenter bucket, you are ready to pitch your yeast, take a gravity reading, add the airlock, and voila, we are done and this thing is ready to ferment. So that's a pretty standard brew day for me. Um, there's a lot of things I could have done differently to optimize the process or, or just done things differently, but I felt I wanted to start with a standard baseline, something that if you just bought the, the starter kit, you know, maybe this is your first time going to all grain, it's a good place to start. You don't have to buy all that extra equipment or do all those extra different things. You practically just need that mash tun, kettle, and you know, ice. Don't worry about getting too technical right off the bat, okay? Take it slow, enjoy the process, get used to everything because we're we're here to have fun, you know? This is this is all about having fun, making good beer and enjoying it while we do it because really you're not saving money making your own beer at home, you know? It's cheaper to actually go buy already made beer than it is to make it yourself, but to make it yourself is a fun process and you get to make the beer that you really want to drink. You know, so I encourage you, don't worry about it at the start. Just have fun with it. Start getting to enjoy the process because that's what it's really gonna be all about. So it has been a few days since the brew day, but I just wanted to go over quickly the fermentation vessel. Now, if you just got a starter kit, you probably came with its own fermenting bucket or, or container, and you're just gonna wanna use whatever they sent you provided that there is enough headspace. As you can see here, we had a three gallon batch and I am using a five gallon container. And I would say that you probably want a good 30% headspace when you go into your primary fermenter. There is gonna be a layer of foam and that's called croisin from the yeast activity. What happens if you don't have enough headspace is that croisin can get clogged in the airlock and then all of a sudden your beer is gonna be fermenting under pressure, which will eventually blow the airlock or break the vessel and you'll have a big mess to clean up. So make sure you have enough headspace and everything's gonna be great. So for this video, I don't really wanna go into any of the extra steps of whether or not you should rack to secondary or you know how to bottle or go into a keg because that's sort of up to your discretion on what you're going to wanna do. Everybody's different. Some people don't even rack to secondary. Hopefully there'll be more videos that cover like each topic individually, but for now, I just wanted to go through that standardized brew day basics and I really hope you enjoyed it. And I think that's it for me. You know, I know it's kind of a long video just for brew day and the basics of it, but brew days themselves can be long. So <laughs> get started early. You know, it could easily be over five hours just to do this uh, whole thing. I hope you got some good knowledge out of it. I hope you may have learned something or discovered something new, but if you have any questions, if you have any comments, you know, leave them below. I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, and until next time, see ya.